The U.S. has sent upwards of 15,000 troops to the Middle East. Do they know something that we don't? One has to wonder. Also, Fox News did an interview with a former Hamas leader, and his take on what's going on in Gaza is really fascinating. Really interesting to see how a guy like this has a much more common sense approach to what's going on than even some of our own government leaders in the United States. We're going to get into that and much more here on the show. I'm Ben, and this is The Israel Guys. Welcome back to the Israel Guys, where we believe that in a world of Jew hatred and anti-Israel propaganda, you should have a direct connection to the land and people of Israel. Guys, please subscribe to our channel here on YouTube. Help us expand despite YouTube's censor censorship. We are fighting the big tech algorithms, algorithms with everything that we have. You probably heard, we just, but we just got banned with no explanation from Instagram this week. They're coming after us, and we need you to help us to get the word out to people that actually actually want to hear it. You can also join our group on WhatsApp with breaking news straight from the land of Israel and follow us on the social media platforms that will still have us. Guys, the situation in Israel is still very taut. There's a lot of unknowns happening right now. Israel is continuing to conduct their strikes on Gaza. And right now, Israel is stuck in between a rock and a hard place because Israel is softening up Gaza for a ground invasion. A lot of people, there's been a lot of talk online about how um, Israel's stalling the ground invasion, how like, oh, when is this ground invasion going to happen? Um, obviously, no one knows for sure outside of milita Israel's military high command. Um, but from what I've heard, the ground invasion is not stalled. Israel's just actively working towards that ground invasion. There's a lot of things that have to be put in place before that happens. A lot of chips that have to be set exactly, you know, exactly right before that happens. And they're just working towards that. And when the time is right, the time will be right. It's not like it's being stalled for external reasons, more than likely. Um, but this rock and a hard place that Israel's stuck in between right now is Hamas has built this massive network of tunnels under Gaza that the command center for Hamas, the Hamas fighters, live in between that, that network of tunnels and the air where Israel's conducting strikes is a blanket of civilian housing of neighborhoods in Gaza. And so in for, in Israel, for Israel to reach those tunnels, they have to bomb the houses on top. So far, Israel's been doing this sparingly and strategically using roof knocking techniques and phone calls and pamphlets to warn, um, to bomb strategic targets, to warn civilians to get out first and then bomb those targets. Honestly, kind of what needs to happen before ground invasion is Israel really needs to loosen up these tunnels. And in order to do so, they really have to bomb a lot of surface area, which is what Israel's trying to avoid. And that's why they're stuck in between a rock and a hard place, because the less bombing that happens of these tunnels before the ground invasion, the more soldiers Israel will lose, God forbid, in the ground invasion, because tunnel warfare is no joke, especially when Hamas has had lots of time to prepare for an invasion. You know, you're talking about probably, you know, gas, maybe chemical weapons, booby traps, like who who knows what could be waiting for the ground troops that go in. And so the more Israel can do from the air at this point, the better. But the more they do from the air, the more they're putting the civilians in Gaza in danger. And the more they're jeopardizing themselves on the international stage. So that's the rock and the hard place that Israel's sitting in between right now. And uh, Lebanon on Israel's northern border so far is not giving a whole lot of indication as to whether they're going to throw their full weight into this war. They've been feeling the waters, testing the waters quite a bit, shooting a dozen rockets every day or so, shooting some anti-tank fire, you know, a couple different things every day. Uh, the IDF has been responding in force, but so far they haven't fully joined the attack yet. As a reminder, if Lebanon joins this war, this is a whole different ballgame. Hamas is one thing. Lebanon is a whole different story. They have a direct channel. Hamas has been under some form of control by Israel as far as the weapons they're able to ship in from Iran. Obviously, it doesn't done a whole lot of good because they still have tens of thousands of rockets and all this crazy military equipment. But Lebanon is just an open port from Iran. Um, and so they have hundreds of thousands of sophisticated rockets pointed straight at Israel, a great military. Um, and I say Lebanon, but officially this is Hezbollah. We're talking about the terrorist organization that's taken over 
huge swaths of Lebanon. I know there's there are a lot of good people left in Lebanon that would not identify with Hezbollah, uh, but on the southern portion of Lebanon, Israel's northern border, we're talking about this this threat from Hezbollah. And so far, it still remains in the air. If Hezbollah gets in the war, this is a whole different level of warfare, and we still don't know if that will happen as of yet. If they do, we're talking about a huge, huge conflict directly with Israel. We're, we're talking about if Israel strikes back. I mean, obviously, if, the, if, if Hezbollah attacks Israel, it's going to be a tremendous strike from Israel back on Hezbollah. Um, if they do, Iran probably will open another front in Syria um, uh, to attack Israel through moving huge amounts of equipment into Syria. There's also, Iran has uh, some, I think, 200,000 troops in Syria, like highly, highly um, experienced troops, um, ISIS fighters, and the whole works in Syria. That would be used, leveraged against Israel. And then, if Israel really pushes this front with um, Hezbollah and Syria, Iran's been working up to this for a very long time. Iran has a lot, a lot invested in this, invested in this push to destroy the state of Israel. And uh, if Israel strikes back, if Israel really pushes Hezbollah, pushes Syria, pushes Hamas enough, we could be looking at uh, Iran getting involved directly, which we don't know if that would happen, but we could be looking at that. Hence, maybe why the U.S. is sending so many troops to the region. We could be looking at Iran as backed in some capacity to be ru by Russia. Who knows what could happen there? A lot of world actors involved in this. We could be looking at something much bigger than what's even the horrific events that are even going on right now. Obviously, we don't know any of that for sure, and it seems like it would hinge on Hezbollah getting in the war or not. My guess with Hezbollah is that they're right now counting the cost. I think from everything we've heard, they had planned to join this war. It was, it was a planned attack between Hamas, Hezbollah, and Syria, um, all backed by Iran. It was supposed to be one huge push on destroying the state of Israel. It seems like Hamas jumped the gun, wanting to get the glory for themselves and set the rest, the other actors at a bit of a disadvantage. And my guess is that Hezbollah is right now counting the cost, especially with the U.S. getting involved uh, wondering if it's a good idea for them to make this move or not. And the U.S. has been sending a lot of firepower to the Middle, Middle East. We're talking about two aircraft carriers, a number of destroyers, um, command ships, ton, a ton of uh, Air Force jets, F-35s, F-18s, um, and a total of about 15,000 American military personnel up to this point. Um American aircraft, let's see, each American aircraft carrier has about 5,000 American soldiers. Um, the, uh, let's see, the destroyers and missile ships, 1,500 to 2,000 each. Um, plus, we could be talking about submarines might be accompanying the fleet. We don't know for sure. There's There's been some talk about that as well, as well as the crews of the jets and the helicopters and everything that are on these aircraft carriers. Um Plus, it seems like Israel's sent some special forces to the region for consultation, put um, a bunch of Marines on standby. We know that the U.S. is sending military to bases in Syria, uh, possibly to Jordan as well. And so it, it really makes you wonder what the U.S. knows that Israel doesn't. Um, up until this point, word on the street has been that the White House had told Israel and um, that if Hezbollah attacks, that the U.S. would support Israel um, in in that attack. Basically, they had the word on the street was that the reason the U.S. was sending this much firepower to the region was that if Hezbollah attacked Israel, the U.S. would provide the air support that Israel needed to carry out the defense the, the, the defense against Hezbollah in Syria. Um, and, and I think so far that's been a huge deterrent for Hezbollah, a huge scratch their head and think about this kind of moment as to whether they want to tango with the U.S. and Israel combined together. And I think that's how I think that's held a lot of deterrence for Hezbollah. Um, but maybe not anymore. Um, with Biden, as, as we talked about yesterday, Biden was in Israel the uh, day before yesterday. And... Um, uh, a reporter asked him specifically about that, and I, I just pulled this from the White House, uh, whitehouse.gov, um, where they had a transcript of this conversation. A reporter said, may I ask you to Joe Biden about, there's a report in the Times of Israel that says the Biden, Biden officials have indicated to Israel in recent days that if Hezbollah in, initiates a war, 
against Israel, the U.S. military will join the IDF in fighting the terrorist group. President Biden, not true. The reporter, not true. President Biden, that was never said. So, um, the White House has said that sending all this military firepower to the Middle East is specifically to deter Hezbollah. But I don't understand what's going on because if you send this to the Middle East to deter Hezbollah, deterrence means they have to they have to believe that you're willing to get in the fight, right? And then if you openly announce that we're not willing to get in the fight, then what kind of deterrence does that have? I don't I don't understand that. It's like that's like somebody's about to rob a grocery store and you pull out a gun and step in front of the door and say, I'm gonna deter you from robbing this grocery store. But then somebody asks you, are you willing to stop them from robbing the grocery store? And you say no. Like, honestly, I, I really don't understand what's going on here. Um, I, I just, I don't understand it in, in the least bit. Deterrence is not deterrence if you're not willing to deter. And, and, unless I'm really missing something here. Um, in a minute, we're going to go into a really interesting conversation with a senior Hamas, a former senior Hamas member uh, that Fox News did. Uh, but first, the brutal attack that Hamas inflicted on Israel on October 7th was the worst tragedy to befall the Jewish people since the Holocaust. We believe that now is the time for Christians from around the world to stand with the land and people of Israel and provide support during this time of horrific crisis. Operation Itai is being organized by Christian and Jewish organizations from all over the world to airlift vital supplies and critical equipment immediately to the communities in Judea and Samaria, ensuring that they stay protected during these terrible times. We will be bringing things like protective vests, helmets, bullet uh, thermal drones, night vision goggles, binoculars, flashlights, security cameras, security gates, food, the list goes on and on and on. Now is the time of people for people from around the world to rise up with one voice and equip and defend Israel's biblical heartland, ensuring that a situation like the attacks that happened from Gaza will never be created inside the region of Judea and Samaria. Please join us if there's ever a time to show your support for the nation of Israel. It is now. We have a number of airplanes already lined up to transport the needed equipment to Israel from the United States. All we are asking for is your financial support. Go to serveisrael.com slash emergency campaign or click the link in the description below. Please join us today. So the other day, Fox News did an interview with the son of a founding Hamas leader uh, who himself was also high up in Hamas at one point. Um, years ago, he renounced Hamas, renounced, he ended up having to turn his back on his family as well. He being, became a Christian, fled to the United States. His name is Mosab Hassan Yosef. Um, and check out some of this interview right here. It's really fascinating stuff. First of all, we need to evacuate civilians as much as we can. You know, this is an ugly war and Israel did not start it. Hamas did. First of all, we need to encourage civilians to go into Egypt, possibly women and children, maybe men over 50 years old. These need to get out of the picture. You know, then the strip need to be cut two pieces, north and south, two parts. The northern part, this is where most of the tunnels are. They, we need to have a solid siege, okay? for long enough to deplete the enemy and to starve them. After that, we may need to explore using gas. This is like sounds horrible, but I don't see any other option. The tunnels are interconnected and gas could be one of the solutions, but this has to be in the right time. We cannot just rush into Gaza. You know, there is no modern army that is prepared for this type of war. So it's telling that someone who was involved with Hamas at a very intimate level at one point has extremely, extremely clear vision of what needs to happen um, in this in this case of absolute pure evil rearing its head in the world. And I feel like Israel has a fairly clear vision of that as well right now, especially with the additional details that continue to come out every single day as to the atrocities that were committed um, in the original attack by Hamas. We're talking about awful, awful stuff that's so terrible, it's difficult for our minds to comprehend um, the, the kind of attacks that Hamas carried out on that first day, on that Shabbat, are just, it's it's mind-bending, the amount of pure, pure ideological and, and barbaric, sav savage evil that, that took place. 
Um, I just heard a story, and this is one of the tamer stories um, that have come out, but I just heard a story uh, today of um, a family, husband and wife, and two children, and the Zaka volunteers that that were on, that found the scene to that came in to collect the bodies for a proper burial. They found the family tied up in the living room with awful signs of savage savage torture of uh, that went on for who knows how long. And um, when the Israelis, when the IDF found when when they found um, this family and killed the Hamas terrorists, they killed the Hamas terrorists eating the Shabbat meal that this family had prepared, that they were torturing this family and eating the Shabbat meal that they had put on the table at the same time in their dining room before shooting the family in the head. And um, it's stuff like that that just uh, makes your blood boil. And just for those of us in the West, we have so little comprehension of evil of evil to that to that level that it's, it's so difficult for us to wrap our minds around. Um, but with more and more of this stuff coming out, people who have been involved, like Yosef, Yusuf, they understand this stuff. They understand the mentality behind it, and they understand what has to be done to eradicate these barbarians from the earth. And Israel's starting to understand that a little bit more as well. And um, especially right now with the world beginning to call more and more for a ceasefire in between Israel and Hamas, we have to get this stuff out. We have to tell more people what happened here because it's what's needed for us in the West to maintain a sense of moral clarity. This is not a conflict in between two sides squabbling over a lake or a few square miles of property or whatever, you know, that some of these that some of these um, squabbles happen over and the world calls for a ceasefire and to protect civilians. This is absolute abject evil that reared its ugly head to destroy the state of Israel. Um, the worst tragedy that's befallen the Jewish people since the Holocaust and things that are so barbaric that there are Nazis. There are Nazis that would be horrified by some of the stuff that happened here. And, and that's a phrase that I don't think anyone ever thought that they would say. The Nazis, many of the Nazis, did everything they could to hide the atrocities that they did against the Jewish people. Hamas live streamed it. They put it out public on the internet and are proud of what they did. And in Gaza, and I'm not saying that all Gazans are responsible for what Hamas did, but as a culture, when Hamas did this, they took the bodies of Jewish people, dead and alive, back to Gaza, and tens of thousands of Gazan men, women, and children turned out in the street to celebrate. One of the biggest celebrations you ever saw. In the Arab village below us, in, or the Arab city below us in, in Nablus and Shechem, they were openly passing out candy and sweets on the streets and playing music and, and rejoicing at the news, at seeing the videos of this barbarity coming out of Gaza. This is evil we're dealing with. Israel has to eradicate it. If they do not eradicate it, this will happen again. And the next time it will be worse. Over and over again, Hamas has attacked the state of Israel. Israel has responded and then listen to the world when they called for a ceasefire and let it go. And I believe that this attack, in one way or another, some measure of responsibility for this rests on the countries of the world that have over and over again pressured Israel into ceasefires with Hamas in the past. If they had let Israel or encouraged Israel to take care of business back in 2014 or back before that, again and again with Hamas, this never would have happened. And we have to. We have to today encourage the state of Israel to finish Hamas once and for all. And it's terrible that innocent civilians are getting killed in this. But that's what happens in war. That's what happens in war where you are trying to eradicate evil. Sometimes innocent people get caught up in it. And that's just what has to happen. There's no other way to look at it. There really, there really is no other moral way to look at it. You can't just let Hamas alone to do this again next time. They have a long track record of this. And if the West cowers to Hamas and, and gives a ceasefire now, they will embolden, embolden them to do something even more horrific next time. And we as Americans, we as Christians, we as the international community support them to do whatever it takes. Don't forget to go to serveisrael.com slash emergency campaign to get involved with Operation Itai, bringing the support to Judea and Samaria, the small communities that is very, very needed. Don't forget to subscribe, get the conversation going down below. 
As always, tune out the fake news and tune into what is actually happening here in the land of Israel. We'll be back every day, Monday through Friday, with your direct connection to the land and people of Israel. Israel.